Good afternoon. Welcome to the fourth day of the sixth Around the World Conference. My name is Jeffrey Rockwell. I'm the director of the Cool Institute for Advanced Study, which is your host for this uh, Around the World Conference. Today's topic is sustainability in the public. I'd like to remind people that there are a number of ways that you can comment on what you see and uh, ask questions. If you go to the website, around the world, one word, dot ualberta dot ca, you'll see that uh, we are streaming it live and if you scroll down you can see an area where you can uh, type in questions. You can also tweet using the hashtag uh, ATW2018, 2018 which will then, uh, uh, will, it'll take a while to refresh, but those, those tweets will then show up uh, to the right of the streaming video. So I encourage people, please, uh, you know, let's, let's take advantage of the opportunity. And we will, if we see questions, we will sneak them to the presenters in some fashion or another. We'll probably bring little post-it notes up to uh, the chair of <laughs> Alenka. Uh, as I said yesterday, we discovered that we're sharing this hashtag with the American Trombone Workshop. Uh, fortunately, I don't think the workshop is happening right now, so, they, so you, can, you can tweet happily around this, and, and then when the workshop comes up, they can share, uh, share it with us. At this moment, I would like to uh, uh, introduce the chair for t this first session, uh, session Dr. Alenka Bilash, who's been actually one of the pioneers here at the University of Alberta in uh, using e-conferencing, especially to connect people around the world. So over to you, and thank, thank you for you. sharing this. Thank you. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are around the world. I would like to begin by acknowledging that the land on which we gather is Treaty 6 territory and a traditional meeting ground for many Indigenous peoples. The territory provided a traveling route and home to the Cree, Blackfoot, Métis, as it did for the Nakoda, Tsutina, Chippewyan, and other Indigenous peoples. Their spiritual and practical relationships to the land create a rich heritage for our learning and our life as a community. I would also like to thank Ken Hiltner, Peter Kalmus in California, Andrew Glover in Sydney, for agreeing to participate in this panel on academic responsibility and climate activism. Over the course of this Around the World Conference, we have been reminded daily about how the Academy is implicated in the use of fossil fuels, the carbon footprint, and issues of sustainability. On Monday, Amy Amos and Jean Polfus discussed both the dollar and fossil fuel costs of both conducting research in the North and of academic participation in Southern conferences, the places of knowledge mobilization. On Tuesday, the artist panel shared recycling awareness projects, projects that they have been involved in. Yesterday's panel members noted the cultural influence on perceptions of both the problem and approach to solutions of sustainability. Historian Petra Dolita noted how Germany versus Norway experienced and addressed sustainability, while Howard Nye led the audience through the ethical and moral consequences of decision making through theory and philosophical arguments, reminding us of what we might call intergenerational considerations. Yesterday, Terry Anderson also guided us through a brief history of online conferences. Today, we shall address head on the responsibilities of the Academy to respond to the evidence of our impact on climate change and the need for deep structural and cultural transformation in the Academy. In our pre-conference conversations, we decided that we would each take a few minutes to describe some of our work in this area and then move into an open discussion with the audience. Please offer questions and comments via Twitter or online. For my part, as Jeffrey has mentioned, I'd like to say that I have organized five online conferences and have a sixth scheduled for Saturday. However, I must confess that my foray into online conferences was driven more by geography than climate change. Maybe I should be embarrassed to say that. Researchers <laughs> interested in post-Maidan Ukraine were on every continent, but not many in number. I encountered a steep learning curve with the first online conference and had to unlearn, relearn many things, processes, assumptions, technology. But 
when over 1,000 people tuned in from around the world, I was sold. Moreover, the cost of the conference was far less than the cost of a traditional face-to-face -face conference and enabled many to engage, including graduate students and faculty from both richer and much less wealthy countries who would otherwise never have had the funding to travel. It is important that their voices and ideas also contribute to the global dialogue in all disciplines. I would also like to add that it has been much easier to obtain funds to support online exchanges than it is to persuade some of my colleagues about the advantages of online conferences. Hopefully, the arguments made by Ken, Peter, and Andrew will help. And I think we'll now turn to Ken's contribution. Hi, my name's Ken Hiltner. I wanted to start by thanking the coordinators of this event, Oliver and Chelsea and everyone else involved, having put on quite a few unconventional events of this sort. I know that they present real challenges and um, they've done a wonderful job putting this together and, and a whole website, which something like this often needs. So I wanted to talk about academic responsibility, um, specifically in terms of flying. Um, little autobiographical note here in that for most of my life I made my living as a furniture maker for all of my 20s and 30s and um, was deeply concerned you know even at that time about environmental issues and for at least the last 10 years of my life as a furniture maker I never flew anywhere that probably a little more might have even been 12 or 15 years but once I re-entered academia and um, pursued a PhD in my early 40s, I suddenly realized I was required to fly all over the place. Then when I actually became a professor, um, I was flying even more. And it was, of course, expected of me, you know. Um, and even today, in my department, when we have merit reviews and all, we, um, we take into account not just publications, but presentations at conferences. So, you know, that old adage, you know, publish or perish, there's, there's another one in there that most people outside of academia aren't familiar with, and that is present or perish. It's imperative that we present at things like conferences if we, we want to advance in the field. In any event, um, when I did start looking at this problem in academia, I was startled by the scope of it. So I am on the um, sustainability committee here at my university, and not too long ago we did an assessment of the carbon footprint for the entire campus. We took everything that we could into account, so not only buildings, you know, electricity, gas for heating and all that, but the vehicle fleet and, and support structures that are significant, like, you know, housing for students and, you know, all the energy demands of those buildings. We took all that into account, and there was one figure in, uh, that just jumped out at me among all the others, and that is that roughly a third of the carbon footprint from my campus, UC Santa Barbara, comes from air travel, from flying faculty and staff to conferences, talks, and meetings, and the like. To put a number on that, that's 55 million pounds of CO2 or equivalent gases being expended every year. It's an astonishing amount of CO2. And again, it, it's something that's just sort of required by our, our field that we, that we don't you know, much take into account. Now, you know, we can, um, you know, stand back and look at the problem globally. And, and if you look at, you know, air um, travel emissions globally, they're a relatively small percentage, very small percentage, really, of our entire climate footprint. But then, when you realize that most people are not flying, in fact, 19 out of 20 people on the planet are never going to step into an airplane. It's really a global elite that is doing the flying. And, and even among us, and you know, uh, one of those elite com countries, the United States, you know, uh, most people are not flying in the course of a year. Over half of Americans aren't. And it's, it's really just a quarter of Americans that are flying three or more times a year. Unfortunately, academics find themselves in that really rarefied bunch. And 
as I've said before, if we were to equate this to ground transportation, we wouldn't be the people, you know, um, driving, you know, hybrids, you know, carpooling with them or using, you know, e-bikes or anything of the sort. Um, we'd be the people, the solitary drivers in SUVs. It's really a huge problem. So the question is, and I, I guess it's a fair question to ask, and it really is, is, you know, why is someone like me, a professor in the humanities, taking this problem on? Why isn't this a problem really exclusively, or at least primarily, for the sciences? Well, I think that to approach that question, we really have to ask, what's the cause of climate change? Now, on the one hand, uh, the answer to that question is pretty easy. It's climate change is being caused by the rise of atmospheric CO2 and a range of other so-called greenhouse gases. And that's absolutely right. But if we can approach, we can approach that question in an entirely different way, in which case the cause of climate change are a range of human activities that are caused, that require the extraction of all those fossil fuels and, and in turn their burning. I mean things like air travel and ground travel, you know, cars, and a range of other activities. And unfortunately, at the United, in the United States, we lead the world in those troublesome activities. You know, in that sense, you know, we really need to focus on anthropogenic climate change as what it is, you know, anthropogenic, human-caused climate change. And we need to focus on the human activities that are bringing about those changes. And this is not to diminish the importance of the sciences, and I have enormous respect for them. In fact, I know that I'm on a panel with Peter Kalmus, who I know personally, and I have great respect for the work that he does. And just as a little aside, if you if you haven't picked up Peter's um, most recent book, Being the Change, um, you really you know deserve it. To, uh, you know deserve to yourself to do because it's it's a great book and it's uh, it's really useful in a way that that I'm kind of laying out here, and that is you know we we need to to look at the things that we do the way that we live our lives and try to understand it. Um, again, sciences are great; they can help understand the mechanics of climate change. But when it comes to understanding why people why people do what they do, that's really not a question for the sciences, not the you know natural sciences, but rather the humanities and social sciences. And and that's why someone like me is is intervening. Um, as a cultural historian, I'm, I'm very interested in cultural practices, the history of them, how they come about, why they do. And, you know, that, that project really, in a, in, a, in a modern sense, you know, picks up in the 1970s with someone like Michel Foucault. Foucault was an historian that was very fascinated by things like sexuality. You know, where does our, you know, um, modern, where do our modern ideas of sexual identity and preference and all come from? Many people simply assume that they're, they're, they're natural, that we're born with them. But Foucault realized, of course, that they are culturally constructed. They emerge over a period of time and you know we when we're born into a world in which they are already in place we assume they're natural but they're not it's the case with any cultural practice and i would argue um, in the immediate sense the practice of the academic conference you know we're you know we enter academia i entered not that long ago and you know it's just the way it is we assume it's the way it is we don't give any thought to it we assume that you know this practice has to exist the way it does but if you start looking carefully at the practice, you realize, you know, it, it doesn't have to exist just the way it does. That in fact, um, this is a practice that has huge problems. You know, um, first, it can require an enormous, you know, it, it can be responsible for an enormous amount of our personal carbon footprints. Peter Kalmus has actually um, you know, wrote an article where he looked at his personal carbon footprint and realized that two-thirds of it were coming from flying. Well, that's a lot, but if the um, numbers that we have at UCSB are 
or accurate. For many scholars, it can be a third. And, and it might be, for many people, the largest part of their carbon footprint. So environmentally, it's a disaster. And when you start looking at the practice, you realize it's a disaster in other ways, too. Um, because of the cost of, of air travel, um, it means that most people in the developing world um, could not attend a conference in North America or the EU. Um, and the cost of airfare alone can often be greater than the per capita income of those countries, meaning that we've long quietly, summarily excluded a broad swath of the world's scholars from conferences and never gave it a thought. It's also the case that conferences have accessibility issues. If you're in a wheelchair, to try to negotiate an airport and, you know, through security and all that, and then to get on an airplane, off an airplane, ground transportation, get to a conference, deal with all the issues there, and then do the whole thing over again to get home, that's an extraordinary challenge and, and not one that people should have. Furthermore, it's the case that um, you know, if you um, have an issue with something like your hearing, going to a conference can be, you know, a largely useless experience. You know, if you can read lips, great, but even that, if you're back in you know, the back of a room or something, it could be a problem. <clears throat> and, you know, technologically and now it's, of course, possible to, uh, to close caption um, any, any talk if it's pre-recorded. And for our conferences, um, we've done just that, and we actually uh, um, edit the closed captioning for accuracy as well. And it means, what I'm really getting at here is that um, the, this practice is problematic, but if you start thinking about it, there are solutions, relatively easy solutions today, that can resolve these problems, cultural problems and all, and that can have other benefits as well. So, you know, traditionally the academic conference has really been the domain of wealthy or relatively wealthy institutions. and relatively wealthy countries that can afford to do it. Putting on a major academic conference can be, you know, really expensive. Mm, but now, if you do this electronically, it means that, you know, you can surmount that too. So one of the things that we've worked on at UC Santa Barbara is to try to develop what we call a nearly carbon neutral conference that allows an entire academic conference to take place online. And the idea was to use existing technology as much as possible. And what that meant was designing it so that the technology that an individual or an institution had would be sufficient to be a participant in the conference regardless of where they were. So um, we thought about what that would be at a minimum and it's probably a smartphone. And you can you participate in one of our conferences completely by way of smartphone without any issues. And that is not only can you visit the conference, watch the, the talks, comment on the talks, but you can also do film your own talk with a smartphone. I'm actually using a computer webcam now, but um, there's no reason that you, you have to do that. So. And it's also the case that we thought of our conferences as something that could be done um, easily by the, the groups that put them on. So we based ours on WordPress, which is a free open access, um, you know, authoring environment. And that meant that, you know, anyone anywhere can has, has access to the tools and you know, a couple billion people on the planet now have cell phones. It's the case that many people don't, and that bandwidth and all is an issue. But we are talking about academia here, and I think um, most academics and most institutions would have access to some sort of technology that now um, you know, can provide a decent video and stream it. Um, it's also the case that the technology is um, is facilitates things that can't be done otherwise. So going back to the issue of excluding, you know, scholars from all over the world, um, the, there's a problem 
and that is with time zones, you know, um, whenever you do a North American conference, you know, you, you exclude a range of people across the planet who just can't, you know, um, wake up at 3 a.m. to watch the talks. That being said, we came up with the um, with one option, which is to pre-record the talks and extend the conference over a three-week period. And what that um, allows to happen is that you know, um, since our Q and A sessions are text-based, person can you know watch um, talk at a time of their choosing put in um, a, a question in the Q&A and you know the next morning when the person on the other side of the world wakes up they wake up to the uh, to the question and can respond to it um, since it's open for three weeks that allows you know a dozen or more exchanges to take place um, even though they're completely outside of time zone so that's one of the reasons that we've you know we're wondering if real-time events aren't <coughs> problematic in some sense because they will always have that time zone issue. So even if there were newer technology, if you were watching a three-dimensional avatar talking instead of me and you're watching it all in 3D, that's all great. But if you're on the other side of the world, you know, that, that can present a problem. So time shifting may be one of the solutions or part of the solutions. But in the end, I think in terms of activism, uh, part of what we need to do is to look at these practices the way we're, we're looking at, we've been looking at this one, academic travel, and if not make an intervention, at least draw attention to the problem. I happen to be very uh, much impressed by early generations of uh, social justice activists who, you know, didn't necessarily know how to solve the problem at hand. And I'm thinking of like early feminist um, scholars from, you know, 50 years ago even. But they knew that the thing to do at first was to draw attention to the problem, to make the world aware of the problem, to make the world aware of these issues of injustice, and in our case, to make the world aware of environmental problems. Um, I would hope that, 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 you know, in our case, since we're, we're, we're really focusing in on what should be, at least environmentally and in terms of social justice issues, the choir with academics, people who really, you know, we don't have to, to get into the business of trying to convince academics that climate change is real, where the social injustice is a major issue, you know, across the planet in all different sorts of ways, so that then we could you know, um, at least make folks aware of how big the problem is. We've offered up a solution um, in the kind of conferences we're doing. The, conferencing, the conference that you're watching right now is also offering up a solution. Um, do I think that in 20 years, you know, either of our groups will have come up with the, the solution that will, will prove to be the standard? Probably not. And in fact, you know, in our case, we, we cobbled the whole thing together using, you know, entirely existing technology. Um, and we wanted people to be able to emulate it using existing technology. And we often say that um, our approach is built not on tomorrow's technology, but yesterday's or even five or ten years ago. You know, you can use an old computer with an old webcam and you can still participate in this. Will this be the solution? I don't know, but I but I do believe that flying people around across the planet to give a 20-minute talk and be part of an hour and 15-minute panel just doesn't make sense. <clears throat> Online uh, um, activity also has you know a carbon footprint, and increasingly you know a lot of bandwidth on the internet is taken up by just what you're watching now, which is video. Something like 80% of the internet worldwide activity will be taken up by the, um, by video very soon. Well, that's true, and and it does have the carbon footprint. But there are there are a couple things to keep in mind there. One, when we looked at the carbon footprint for our um, nearly carbon neutral conferences when compared to conventional ones, the carbon footprint was less than one percent. 
And furthermore, um, you know, it's principally electricity that's needed to both, you know, run the servers, the data transmission, and all that. And alternative energy coming online, whether it's solar or wind or whatever, is very good at supplying electricity, which is just what we need. In fact, at the University of um, California at Santa Barbara, we are now um, um, part you know, in, in the middle of what we call our climate neutrality initiative. And by 2025, our entire campus will, for the most part, be entirely powered by renewables. When that happens, it means that you know the servers and the data transmission and all that we're using will be solar, uh, largely solar in our case, powered. Um, at that point, that one percent of, of you know carbon footprint will drop to like a tenth of that. What that would mean in practice is that you could conduct a thousand conferences like this for the same carbon or climate footprint as just one traditional fly-in conference. So um, it's, it's really an extraordinary amount of savings that, that can happen. Um, again, I, I don't know that you know, this will be the solution, but I do know that some type of online event seems to be in our future. You will always have the objection, I hear it quite a bit, that you know you lose something really important here, which is face-to-face, -face, you know, conversation, relationships of traditional sort. Well that's right, but if you look at all the advantages, whether it's environmental, cultural, accessibility, and all, I think it clearly weighs that um, that's you know or um, Kind of, those things are kind of almost uh, the loss of personal interaction. I won't say insignificant, but not nearly significant enough to keep us from wanting to change this cultural practice. But you know, it's also the case, and I see it especially with the newer generation of scholars, um, you know, who grew up along with social media, that, that this all makes sense. Interacting online makes sense. You know, um, the majority of people who interact on Facebook with each other live within 25 miles of each other. Um, sure, they could, you know, walk over, bike over, or whatever. But there are certain advantages of an online relationship, um, and, and some of them have to do with time shifting. Not that they're necessarily in other time zones, but you know, they want to say something and get something out now, and you know, a friend of theirs will be at work, but then when they get off work, they'll have time to, to interact with it and all. So I am optimistic that online relationships um, which you know social media has pioneered both in forming and maintaining will play a role in this as well but I, I don't know what the future will be but I I do know that we we need to stop this flying and we need to draw attention to it now and you know our efforts um, by way of our conferences and this conference um, are, are clearly I think one of the early stages in doing that and I, I hope people will look back you know decades from now and 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 pinpoint a conference like this as being very important in uh, as, a, as, a, as a type of activism drawing attention to a problem that helped disrupt that very practice uh, I hope we'll see but um, the very fact that it's being staged and, and you're participating in it by, by viewing and hopefully interacting with my talk, um, I see that as a really positive step. So thank you for, for coming to the conference and thank you for watching my talk. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Ken Hiltner from uh, UC Santa Barbara. And now I'd like to ask uh, Peter Kalmus, also somewhere in California, uh, to, uh, to whom uh, Dr. Hiltner frequently alluded to share some of his ideas uh, and some of his work on climate change. I mean, on okay. sustainability. Okay, thanks. So I'm getting a little bit of an echo. I am going to um, share my screen here, see if this works. Okay, can you guys see the screen? Yep. Okay, 
So I'm going to proceed. Um, so this is what, um, you know, this is what uh, obvious climate change looks like. We live in an era of, of very obvious global warming. Um, this is a small piece of kind of the science, a snapshot of the science. We could talk for impacts uh, for hours, um, but you know the trends are so clear. The signals are coming in everywhere you look in the Earth system. You can look in the, in the ocean, ocean heat. That's the top left plot. You can look at uh, surface air temperature. That's the top right plot. These are global means and their um, you know, annual trends. 17 of the, um, the last 18 years were the hottest on record. So it's remarkable that uh, even among the interannual variability, which, which comes from you know, heat energy moving from one part of the Earth system to the other, going into the oceans, coming out of the oceans, despite this, this natural variability, the trends are coming so clearly and so strongly and so quickly. Um, uh, ice volume in the Arctic, this plot here, um, extreme precipitation events are increasing uh, in frequency. Um, ice sheets in Greenland and in Ant Antarctica are, are decreasing steadily. Um, and of course, sea level is rising. So we don't need more science to know what to do. Um, but I like to ground my talks in the science because I want everyone to know that we have a climate emergency here. All right, so I started using that term as opposed to climate change. And um, I have to say that, you know, right now I'm speaking on my own behalf. This is not a task uh, related to my work at JPL. Um, but I don't feel like I have a choice about speaking out. Um, when I first started speaking out and, and trying to sound the alarm on climate change, um, it felt frightening to me, you know, because not a lot of my peers are doing this. Um, but then, you know, I just started to think about my kids and the reality of what's happening and how the public doesn't have such a clear seat to the changes in the earth system as I do. Um, and, you know, I don't have a choice. So when you don't have a choice to speak out, it makes it very, uh, very easy to do, actually. Um, okay, for some reason, sharing this, okay. So, um, Sometimes I'm, uh, you know, interacting with people in my community. You know, it might be a soccer game for my kids and it might be 105 degrees Fahrenheit or 110 degrees Fahrenheit. And it's just blazing hot and the kids are playing the game. And uh, one of the parents will say to me, you know, this is the new normal. And I want to point out that this is not the new normal. So the nature of trends is to trend. So if there's a change in the physics of uh, the planet of the energy balance, these trends will continue until we take care of what's causing uh, that underlying imbalance. And what's causing the underlying imbalance is not a mystery. We know what it is. It's burning fossil fuel. That's very clear. So um, because of this sense of clarity, I just don't like burning fossil fuel anymore. Um, uh, in 2010, I was kind of, you know, telling everyone we got to stop burning fossil fuel and um, probably alienating a lot of my friends. And uh, eventually it dawned on me that, hey, instead of just running around telling people we got to stop burning fossil fuel, I should actually, actually stop burning fossil fuel in my own life. Um, I was uh, getting on a flight uh, in 2012 uh, and it was uh, for an astrophysics conference because at that time I was still working in astrophysics and I just felt like I didn't belong there, that it wasn't worth flying across the Atlantic uh, to a conference in Europe to give an update, you know, a 15 minute update on my work that my colleagues had already basically heard before and then fly back. I just like thought about my kids again and um, I didn't feel like I belonged on that plane. You know, uh, it just didn't feel worth it. So I haven't flown since then. If if there was something that came up that I felt compelled to fly, I would still do that. But you know, in the in the six years since that flight, nothing 
as even come remotely close to that threshold. So um, in 2010, a couple of years before my last flight, I realized that flying was a large part of my emissions. That was a surprise. So I sat down one night and just kind of figured out what my own personal emissions in one year were. And it only took a couple of hours and then over you know, the next few months. And then while I was working on my book, I refined these, these estimates. But I was really surprised that flying played such a huge role in my emissions. I, I really honestly just had no, I knew it wasn't good, but I had no idea that it was this bad. And I should say that this pie chart is being really generous to flying because it's only considering the uh, direct CO2 effects. Um, but there are also indirect effects uh, from like seeding cirrus clouds high in the atmosphere, from the contrails themselves, which act like cirrus clouds and help warm the planet. Um, so those non, if you include those indirect effects, the, the actual immediate climate impact of flying would be a factor of two or three greater than just the CO2 effects alone. Um, the other big surprise was, was that food was my second biggest source of emissions. Uh, before I made this pie chart, I thought that electricity was my biggest and I was ready to spend a lot of money and put uh, solar panels on the top of my house. Uh, but once I made this pie chart, um, I realized that, you know, I had to gear my priorities to what were my biggest issues. And of course, that was flying followed by food. So, so I engage in something that I call conspicuous non-consumption. So um, kind of turning it into a game, how can I reduce my emissions? And over the course of a few years, I went from a little bit over the U.S. average. So this line here is the U.S. mean right around 20 metric tons per year of CO2 equivalents. So that includes things like uh, methane. Also, all greenhouse gases. Um, and I reduced it to by about a factor of 10 to around two metric tons per year, which is a bit less than the global mean. So this line here is the, the global mean. And it wasn't a sacrifice. It was different. It required thinking about things differently. But I wouldn't really say it was a sacrifice. Um, so these were the biggest changes that I made. Uh, everyone's would look different. Um, I talk about this in gory detail in the book, uh, probably more detail than most people would want. Um, but so food related things, um, getting some of my food from the waste stream. So in the US, about 40% of the food that we grow essentially ends up directly in landfills where it turns into methane. Uh, so I figured out kind of creative ways to dip into that huge waste stream of food. Uh, becoming vegetarian, which I don't mind at all. I thought I would miss meat a lot, but I don't. Um, and then other things like uh, biking a lot more, which is incredibly healthy. So um, I like to say that um, if global warming magically disappeared, I would still do everything that I, that I do. All the changes that I make, that I, I like. The hardest one was probably not flying since 2012. Um, but even then, I, I would still fly way less than I used to uh, just because of being jet lagged, getting sick, feeling homesick for my family and not being able to engage in my community. So if, if you take, you know, half a dozen or maybe more trips per year, like a lot of academics do, that's a huge strain on your family life, on your community life and on your health. And I would say on your sanity. So maybe in a way uh uh, burning fossil fuels. Fossil fuels is like this juice that makes us go really fast. I would say insanely fast. Uh, and then we get addicted to that need for speed. Um, but there's a lot to be said for slowing down a little bit and uh, getting to a sort of a more sane uh, pace of life, reconnecting with the earth, reconnecting with your community. Uh, so um, biking is a great entry level thing um, just to just to underline that these changes can be actually uh, really good for you and also really joyful. I love this quote from JFK that nothing compares to the simple pleasure of riding a bike. I, I would say except maybe um, pulling out weeds uh, shortly after a rain when it's just like really for me really meditative to do that. Okay, so after I give talks, I hear from uh, environmental, environmentalists who are very concerned about global warming, but they tell me they need to fly. Um, and I would say that global warming is part of why it's such a hard thing to deal with, is um, we have to think about our needs uh, versus our wants and how our what we want can actually become needs. Um, so I'm trying to uh, leverage flying less for the purpose of cultural shifts. So nothing that I do is really 
for the purpose of directly keeping CO2 out of the atmosphere. It's to model change and to try to spread the message that a lot of this change uh, can actually make you happier. And that it's maybe something, these kinds of changes aren't things that we necessarily have to be afraid of. Um, I think I'll, there's a lot of assumptions going around in the public about what life with a lot less fossil fuel would be like. Um, and it's only going to get easier as more and more people start doing this. It'll start shifting whole systems, right? And it'll, it'll be easier for people. It's harder for the pioneers to first start using a lot less fossil fuel. But, you know, as uh, you know, public transit, electric cars, fossil fuel free food systems, um, and things like conferences without flying. So, so you know, being able to enjoy a career in academia where um, you're not actually penalized for not flying, right? So right now, if you don't fly, it's really not great for your career. Um, so to that end, I want to show you guys uh, a new website that um, we're working on. So it's called No Fly Climate Side. But don't let that fool you. It's, it's really about flying less. The goal is to try to encourage people to fly less and institutions like academic institutions and professional organizations to start formalizing what flying less in academia might look like. Okay, so um, the way I decided to start doing this is to actually try to link up with some of my colleagues and also members of the public who are already interested in flying less and doing that in their own life, all right? And so this has their stories here, all right? So if you click on any one of these, you can, you can see stories from the actual scientists and members of the public and why they fly less and what challenges that they faced and maybe what they like about flying less, all right? So um, if you're already flying less or if you're interested in flying less, uh, please join us here. Um, then the idea is if, if you know, enough people from the same institution get together, uh, maybe there's some way to put some pressure on the institution and formalize flying less. Uh, we haven't reached that point yet. So this is a, this is a bridge that we're trying to cross. Um, your ideas are welcome. But I think the reason we haven't gotten to this point yet is that we haven't quite reached a critical mass. So we need more pioneering individuals to come on board and then to start sharing this idea, you know, that we can fly less, that we can thrive with flying less. And that, you know, as academics, we have a responsibility to fly less. And I would say that our academic institutions have a responsibility to support this since they basically, uh, you know, what's the message? Like they're trying to make a better world, especially for young people, right? Through educating young people, through doing research. Um, so it's time to shake our institutions out of their sort of torpor, right? They're, they're kind of like, they're safe um, kind of disciplinary torpor to start looking at the big picture of what's, you know, how do we make a better world, you know, and can we do that by kind of like safely, you know, keeping our heads down, staying within our disciplines, or do we have to look at this bigger picture? Okay. So I'm not saying, I don't think any of us are saying that we shouldn't travel just that we have to reduce our emissions. We have to find ways to travel that don't have so much emissions, eventually that have zero emissions. And uh, conferences like this can help us get to that point. All right. So um, I urge everyone to think about what one person can do, how we can uh, work together as a team to shift the culture. And um, I would leave you with uh, this challenge. Uh, that it's very clear to me, uh, if you think, fast forward to like the year 2100, uh, that burning fossil fuels should no longer be socially acceptable. Uh, and it's up to us to try to raise that awareness and uh, allow that idea to percolate until it's a common idea, until it's an accepted idea. And that's, that's all I have. Okay, thank you, Peter. And now let's uh, travel to Australia uh, using no fossil fuels and have uh, some comments from Andrew Glover, please. Sure. So I'll uh, just do a quick presentation as well. Um, just going to screen set up a screen share. Okay. Uh, 
So as a link, I said, my name is Andrew Glover. Can everyone see that, by the way? Yes. Can Peter, can you let me know? Yeah, great, thanks. Um, so we've been doing some work on um, on flying and what we sort of term aero mobility. So this is thinking about academic air travel as sort of a system of, um, of air travel rather than just, I guess, individual choices uh, around flying. Um, so we've had a few projects on, on the project we've called the Work Life Ecologies. We've done an analysis of Australian university sustainability policies and their research strategies. Um, we, we've surveyed academics about their air travel uh, and, and their use of non-flying alternatives. We've done some in-depth interviews with academics to really understand their sort of experience of, of air travel, what they get out of air travel and going to conferences and how they might network um, both online and offline. And then we've also done some work on, um, on di what we call digital conferencing. So, and this is obviously an example of that and ways that we can remote, um, remotely collaborate with each other. Oh, this is just going to skip ahead for me. Okay, so um, the sustainable air travel um, policies, we did a review of, of all 43 uh, Australian universities um, with the, the research question of how seriously are Australian universities taking the task of reducing uh, carbon emissions from air travel. And um, half uh, the universities, 53% of them, were, were what we call air travel ignorers. So they essentially had no uh, air travel sustainability policy um, uh, or they didn't have in, even have any sustainability policy whatsoever. Um, the second group we called recognition without intervention. So that was 16% of the universities where they, they acknowledged that air travel was uh, a contributor to climate change um, and that they should do something, but they didn't specify what they would do. And then the last group was what we called air travel substitutes. They were universities and they said that they wanted to reduce the emissions from air travel, but... Um, and the way they were going to do that was primarily through substituting air travel through another means. So usually video conferencing was the way they, um, was, was the particular mode that they described. Um, then we looked at uh, the policies for air travel out. So policies for air travel uh, and university policies, um, because we surmised that, that the air travel policies weren't, that the, the, the forces that were kind of compelling academics to fly weren't in the sustainability policy that was sort of broader than that. And so we reviewed um, 14 Australian university strategic plans and internationalisation policies, and we found that there's a broad impetus to internationalise Australian universities. And there are all these assumptions in these research strategies and strategic plans and internationalisation policies about um, staff and student mobility as being both desirable and kind of necessary. And this is particularly the case for, uh, for Australian academic institutions because um, because of our remoteness, our physical remoteness, being in the global south, um, we kind of need to fly uh, usually to Europe or the US to, to go to conferences. And so air travel was sort of seen as increasingly integral to achieving these strategic objectives around internationalisation. So why do academics fly? Um, the, there's been some work on, on air travel done in, in the mobilities literature and they describe it as, as air travel as facilitating what they call network capital. So this is this idea that um, the particular academics and professionals more generally, um, they network capital is the ability to sort of uh, to forge connections uh, and linkages with other people and institutions and, and to leverage those, those linkages uh, into things like publications and research grants, um, promotions and whatnot, keynote, uh, international speaking um, arrangements. So, uh, and, and as I said, these are, these are sort of the most prized elements of the academic career. Um, so aeromobility, this sort of system of air travel, we argue has co-evolved with the institutional orientations of Australian universities towards internationalisation. So it isn't just about academics wanting to fly more, it's about universities wanting to become more internationalised and uh, wanting to sort of compete on a global market and academics competing with each other on a global market. And in order to do that, in the current arrangement, you have to fly a lot or you're encouraged to fly a lot. And this obviously has these environmental and social implications that um, both Peter and Ken have discussed. So uh, sort of moving on from this work, we've, we've been thinking about how we can remotely collaborate. So how do we collaborate, and I, I use the term collaborate quite broadly there, uh, with others remotely so that we don't constantly have to be flying around the world to uh, give presentations and chat to other academics. So we've 
I had a couple of different projects here. The first one was a, a virtual conference meal. So part of our work on conferencing and with academics is we recognize that um, it wasn't often wasn't just the, the presentations um, that academics found valuable at conferences. They also found the, uh, uh, the conference meal. So the conference dinner and the lunches, there's, there's opportunities for kind of incidental contacts um, and chats with people that they found incredibly valuable. And so we tried to kind of replicate that digitally and, and virtually um, by having a, a co-located meal. So we were in Melbourne eating dinner. We had some colleagues uh, in Lancaster uh, that were eating breakfast, so the time difference uh, element there as well. That was just an interesting exercise in, in, in what a, a, a digital conferencing meal might look like. Um, the other project we have is about telepresence robots, and um, I'll get uh, Claire to play the video that I've got here just to give you a, a description of what it looks like. Um, can you play that, Claire? So these are, these are remotely controlled devices to attend. Um, you might be able to see it there. I hope people can see that. It should be a, a little robot rolling around a conference floor. <laughs> Great. <laughs> anyway, so that's that's what they call a telepresence robot, and we've been um, attending conferences via one of these robots. So you essentially control it remotely. It's got a screen and a camera and a microphone and allows you to have a physical presence in a remote space like a conference. And so um, some conferences actually uh, have offered, offered this as a way to attend their conference for people that couldn't access the conference. Um, and so it's an interesting way to, to think about, you know, how would you treat a robot? How would you um, physically interact with someone at a conference? And is this kind of a viable way to reduce emissions? Obviously, it, it might be problematic if everyone was a robot, but, you know, I think it's a, an interesting way to think about how we can have remote. Um, so I think I'll just leave it there because I think we're running short of time. Thank you very much, Andrew. So part of our responsibility as academics toward climate activism is to take this evidence and respond to it. I think I'd like to now open the floor to uh, questions from the public as well as to generating more opportunities for solutions to some of the challenges that we've been faced. I have one question here. Um, Conference organizers, both academic and corporate, are hard to convince. Where and how can we make progress influencing them? I've got Peter and Andrew and Ken. Anyone uh, would like to start uh, responding to that one? Well, I can, I'll start, Thanks, sure. Andrew. I mean, I think yeah. the, um, I think the, uh, University administrators, they um they pay attention to, to money <laughs> and to, to the costs. And if we show them how expensive it is to to fly uh, frequently, they'll they'll listen and they'll see, particularly with these these online conferences. And uh, someone mentioned before how much cheaper it is it is to organise something like this. Um, I think they will start to pay attention to that. And I suppose the paradox is that that it, in order to do this well, and I'm thinking about into the future here where we might want to integrate um you know some more immersive technologies then they will require some investment but i think over the long term the cost of flying you know someone uh, around the world when you think about air travel tickets it's not just air travel tickets but it's the transfers and the accommodation uh to for conference travel it really adds up very quickly and it's actually chewing up a lot of research budget and that's funding that could be put to creating knowledge, I think, in, in ways that are more efficient and better use of funds. So that would be one, uh, one reason <laughs> they might listen. Thank you, Peter. I'll add something to that. Yes. Um, so I think we can appeal to their better natures as well. So the, um, the American Anthropological Association, so I, you know, humanities have a huge role to play here, but you know, in, the, in, in the field of anthropology, there's a, um, you kind of a, a you know, 
do no harm uh, ethos that's, I think, being invoked by a lot of the scientists, or a lot of the anthropologists in the field who, you know, who feel like they fly in, you know, study a culture and then fly out and they can see how climate is affecting these cultures that they're studying. And so they realize that, you know, they have this deep ethos of, of not harming and, and they, they've made that connection in a way that, you know, for example, the American Geophysical Union hasn't, that's the earth scientist, hasn't really made yet. But I think, you know, these institutions, both the professional organizations and the universities, um, have kind of at some level taken a, a moral stance, like wanting to make a better future for everyone. Um, and so I think we can appeal directly to that as well. Um, another question. How effective is motivating action by guilt? Academics have a big travel bug. It's the largest industry in the world, in addition to present or publish. I don't think it's a very, very useful way to go, personally, um, in my experience. Um, I've, you know, I, I'm on Twitter and things can get sort of, uh, yeah, let's say real on, on Twitter. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm trying to, uh, to, to find, to build alliances um, with, with other scientists, for example, who are flying less. Some of them are flying much less, right? And then there's, there's kind of uh, the, the Puritan crowd who doesn't fly at all. And sometimes, you know, they try to shame even the, the, the potential allies who are flying a lot less. Um, and, and I can say from experience that it's not helpful. Um, and I can also say that in the course of my entire life, I've not met anyone who has never burnt fossil fuels. So, I mean, it's all kind of where you draw the line, right? Everyone's burning. We should all try to reduce. And if anyone is trying to reduce, even if they're still flying a bit, if, if they're reducing, they should be, you know, they're an ally and, and we should, embrace that um so i you know i i think the psychologist would probably tell us maybe that it, when you try to guilt somebody into doing something uh, they tend to get defensive um and i don't think if in my experience it's not an effective way to to uh to change things yeah, I, I would concur with that as well i mean I, my colleague yolandi stringers has done some work um with one of Australia's banks in trying to reduce their air travel emissions. And of course it was the primarily the executives and the, were the high flyers, the ones that were flying a lot. And so they'd had a, um, uh, I think a board, a high flyers board to kind of shame them saying these people are flying too much, but of course they were flying in because it was part of their role. And in order to succeed in their role, they had to, you know, uh, fly a lot, you know, uh, meet other companies, meet prospective clients. And so it's just about changing that system. And, and she suggested that it perhaps wasn't the best option to just shame them, that they actually need to think about itself that, that kind of demanded this travel. And, and likewise, I think a lot of academic roles, um, I've interviewed some um, senior academics who kind of coordinate large projects between cities and in the developing world. And they, the, 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 the role itself kind of requires a bit. So it's about thinking about, um, these particular roles and how we can make particular, um, you know, particular senior academic roles be less flying intensive because a lot of the time it's the senior academics that are actually flying a lot because they have to maintain these, this, these networks that they, they have uh, and they're the, often the ones getting invited to, to speak at conferences and coordinate international projects. I want to add one more quick comment here, which is that I think we have to keep firmly in mind what our goal is in, if we're reducing our own emissions, okay? There's seven and a half billion people on this planet. So when I reduce my own, own emissions, I'm not solving global warming, all right? What I'm doing is I'm trying to set an example. I'm trying to demonstrate that it's possible for the purpose of cultural shift so that we can make space, cultural space, political space for broader systems change, right? Our politicians, they're not going to 
put some you know carbon price policy before the public if they know that's going to be unpopular they know the public doesn't care about climate change so we need to raise this awareness with the public but if we're talking about climate change and the need for for solutions and how urgent it is and we're not changing ourselves then that message is much less powerful than it could be okay so so i think that the, the puritans who are kind of maybe more interested in shaming and you know like I, i'm burning less than you right so you should feel shame they may have a slightly different perspective a very different perspective which is you know kind of they're thinking somehow that their action is directly part of the solution but i, I think it's important to remember that there's kind of this chain and i think that what we are is is really kind of pioneers for influencing culture and then once you have that perspective, I think that any temptation to make someone feel guilty goes away. Great. Uh, I, wonder, I wonder if we could continue something that we chatted about the other day in preparation for this. And that is, uh, we've talked a bit about academics in the institution and policy and policy makers. What about the students? How do we influence them? They are the future of this cultural shift. Sure. Yeah. I mean, the students, <laughs> um, kind of, they they are part, I suppose, of the the international um, internationalization of universities. So uh, generally, when when universities are internationalizing, they they're seeking uh, markets for foreign students, uh, international students. Um, there are all these expectations that well, they will they will fly. Um, I think part of the reason it's uh, universities sort of take a or turn a blind eye to this in a way is because they don't consider those uh, emissions from those flights to be directly their responsibility. So even though they are seeking international students and hoping they'll come and, uh, and attend the university, um, the, the flights that they'll be taking to and from the campus and going home to visit uh, on a pretty regular basis, the university generally doesn't consider those to be their emissions. And so you don't actually even see these um, emissions in reports, right? Even though they are, um, they, they're quite embedded in, in the whole university um, kind of organization, but they're not formally university emissions. So, but there definitely it needs to be more attention to that. And just before I invite Peter, I think that's a really important um, example of how structural change must continue because the internationalization of campuses are a result in part of the hierarchy that's been, or the uh, assessment of campuses worldwide. And one of the criteria in some of these assessments is actually internationalization. Measuring the number of students from different places, the number of professors from different places, et cetera. So we have to again yeah. look deeply at this structural change. Uh, Peter, did you want to add anything to that? No, let's move on. Okay, good. To the next question. So okay. I have a, is, um, is Ken on the line, by the way? I haven't heard from no, Ken. No, he's not, actually. Unfortunately, he's okay. not. Okay. Yeah. So uh, I have a, a question comment from uh, Dr. Howard Nye, who uh, spoke yesterday. He says, Re, especially Hiltner's idea about losing face to face interaction, would not the optimal combination be one where we combine one? live interaction online with two opportunities for non-live text interaction. We're doing that a bit at this conference right now, both among the participants, for example, Petra in Calgary and I in Edmonton, and with the audience able to ask questions live, while we've also had opportunity for non-live text interaction. Could some conferences not also involve arrangements between particular panels to meet live at a time that works for them, which would be available non-live to those who aren't uh, able to meet uh, to make it to the live stream comments well i'd yeah. start out by saying the more we do this the better we're going to get at it just as a very general comment go ahead andrew yeah i think that's really important i mean thinking about the conference as kind of an archive of interactions so rather than just something that happens in a certain place at a certain time and people Kind of congregate and then disappear and forget about what happened and no one kind of has access to those to that information whereas you know if we've recorded this say and um, and those questions are on twitter people can answer those and, and discuss that at uh, at any time and so that does provide opportunities for people who can't 
uh, attend on the day or people who, you know, are in the wrong time zone, it's the middle of the night and they can wake up and, and see what's going on and still participate. So I think that the opportunity for kind of disaggregated conference um, activity is, is definitely worth uh, integrating into these new conferencing practices. I'd just like to add that in some of the conferences that I've organized, we've already begun doing that. And we've experimented yeah. with um, having two hubs, for example. So people come uh, live to one area and live to another area, and then they're in constant interaction. So really, the potential is great. It depends very much on our creativity, much less, I would say, than the evolving technology. Have another question. This yeah. is one from Terry Anderson, uh, truly a veteran in this area. And he says, well, there's something I'm missing right now. It's the ability to stick my hand up and verbalize a question. How can we motivate, motivate more participation, more voices of participants? Okay, back to you. Peter? Well, we can keep our talks shorter <laughs> for one thing um i don't know i mean it would be it would be nice if um yeah i've been in some uh, some some teleconferences where you know you can see everyone's got a camera right you can see everyone and there's like a little hand hand raising icon so i think um there are sort of technological approaches to that um you know it, it's in my opinion um it's we're not at the level where where this kind of conference is, is going to be as good as, as a face-to-face -face conference. But then it's so much less expensive in so many ways, you know, financially, uh, in terms of time, there's no travel time in terms of carbon emissions, that maybe the, the like the effectiveness of this interaction divided by the costs is actually just as high or maybe higher than going to face-to-face -face conferences. Um, so again, I think we'll get better as we practice. Um, you know, virtual reality is on the horizon. Um, maybe there's a way to have like a virtual audience and sort of start seeing, you know, if we can identify exactly what it is about that situation that, you know, face-to-face -face conference that we find most satisfying, maybe it's the ability to raise a hand, maybe it's the ability to interact with each other during break times, maybe it's the ability to have a beer together. You know, if we identify those things carefully, then as the technology gets better and it's getting better quite rapidly, you know, maybe we can, start to experiment with um, going to a completely new kind of remote conference that will make what we're doing now, you know, look really primitive in comparison. Great, Andrew? Yeah, it's, I mean, this might be a, a good opportunity for um, Claire to just play that second video, which is this um, new Microsoft. I, I don't see it as sort of a silver bullet, but it's, a, it's an interesting technology considering that we're talking about the, the opportunities that having a physical body in a place um, kind of represents, you know, the ability to, to signal that you want to ask a question or um, the, the ability to, to, to approach someone, to, to overhear what other people do. Uh, a physical presence somewhere uh, amidst other bodies is really important. So uh, is Claire there and able to play the video just for like a, just 30 seconds of the video? Hi, today we're going to show you an exciting new technology that could fundamentally change the way that people will communicate in the future. Imagine being able to virtually teleport from one space to another in real time. Hey, Sergio. Yes, How does it feel like to be holoported? It feels great to be holoported. So if Sergio is to wear his HoloLens device, <laughs> and I'm going to wear mine, we can see each other in full wow. 3D in real time. We can interact and communicate as if we're co-present. Sergio, can you walk around my space? Can you walk behind this chair? So we're doing everything to give the impression that Sergio and I are present in the same space. Sergio, let's just do a high five. <laughs> That's bye great. Bye. Thank you, Sergio. We call this technology holoportation. That, that's probably now, to, to make all this happen, we had to create a new us. type of 3D capture technology. <laughs> Anyway, so you can see, that, as we were saying, these, these technologies are evol evolving and they are kind of becoming more immersive and, and sort of capturing the physicality that we get from uh, attending a conference. So that, that's, that's something, as I said, I think it's a little way off, but it's, it's worth considering what that might be able to offer in terms of video um, e-conferencing, digital conferencing.
Andrew, thank you, Peter. Thank you, Ken. I think you've offered us some real examples of live action change. And you've started to create that cultural shift. And I hope that this conference will help to add to that critical mass. I want to remind us that we've got two new terms, or new to me anyway, climate emergency. And uh, the other one was not only hollopartation, but aeromobility. <laughs> So uh, let's start to use go. those words and have them become a part of our, uh, our everyday conversation. And I think those are terms that will help us address this issue. Thank you again. Great. Thank you. Thanks a lot. So thank you, uh, Alenka, for uh, a, a really fascinating conversation. And uh, we're now going to teleport, not holoport, but uh, teleport to uh, the University of Western Sydney, or Western Sydney University, again in Australia, where I think Andrew Glover, uh, Glover is, for a roundtable discussion on living labs, resilient cities, and repair culture. Uh, I'm going to pass it over to the chair there, Hart Cohen. Over to you. Is this pre-recorded, or is it live? Hello. My name is Hart Cohen. And I'm lecturer in the School of Humanities and Communication Arts and a member of the Institute for Culture and Society at Western Sydney University. So welcome to Western Sydney University. We're all thrilled to be part of the Around the World Conference on Sustainability today. I'm going to introduce my panel and then give a short uh, introduction to our panel topic. On my left is Abby Melek Lopez and on my Far right is Alison Gill, and on my right is Mariella Hatfield. I would also like to thank David Levy, who's our television studio technician, for supporting this particular initiative in the TV studio facility of Western Sydney University. With environmental sustainability a key research priority for this university, it's especially important for the university to also reflect this priority in the context of the campus itself, its facilities, its environmental practices, and in research projects that its staff will undertake. So today our presentation is really driven by the particular projects that individuals here on the panel have developed over the recent uh, period. With troubling signs in climate in one of the most marginal countries in the world, Australia, and with respect to climate issues such as drought and flood, we sense that Australia is poised precariously to face very serious climate challenges. But as well, we have some excellent advantages in Australia for non-fossil fuel sources for energy generation. And so in a way, we're at the point of really trying to engage prolifically with that series of possibilities to be able to challenge the issues that surround us with respect to climate change. So let's hear from our first speaker, Abby Melek lopez um, So I'm going to focus on the concept of the campus living lab, or more specifically in my research, the transdisciplinary living lab, as a really important way to do sustainability research. The first thing to say, I think, really, is that sustainability throws up a lot of intractable or wicked problems about how we choose to live that often involve the most mundane of everyday activities, how we feed ourselves, drink water, move around, keep cool, and it's particularly important in Australia um, and where we're located in Western Sydney and so on. So these everyday embodied practices have material, social, cultural, economic and technological dimensions. And so are naturally inclined towards a transdisciplinary approach. But what is transdisciplinarity? It's something that's often talked about, but it is a very challenging concept to work with because we're going beyond simply participation of different disciplines together to trying to integrate both professional and personal knowledge in creating new ways, new paths forward, which is extremely challenging. So in a way, transdisciplinary living labs are about 
learning how to do that, learning how to work together and collaborate with different disciplines to solve, or not even to solve, but to learn about um, redirecting some of these very basic and mundane um, resourcing requirements of everyday life. And in a way, that's the really tricky thing is going between what we have now and what we want to aspire to. So that space between, which is a space of transition, um, really does require a lot of imagination, experimentation and risk. And that's why uh, the Living Lab um, is such a great um, device for uh, doing that. So the Living Lab lends itself to university campuses because they are, our core business as universities is to generate new knowledge and all that comes along with that, like falling over, making mistakes, happy accidents, failing. I mean, this our core business um, accommodates some of those risks. So as we um, develop living labs, this is something that is extremely important um, for the students to be exposed to. So essentially setting up experiments that trial different social practices, different ways of living on campus um, are a really important way of incubating new social practices, new technologies and um, ways of resolving some very intractable problems that scale from individual experience through to global concerns out of the bounded geography of the campus, um, such as the aspirations embedded in the Sustainable Development Goals. Just to give this a little bit of substance, I'll just talk very quickly about one project that I've invo been involved in that um, is a collaboration, and I think sustainability demands collaboration between universities with the Institute for Sustainable Futures at the University of Technology. And it is a bit like the gift that keeps on giving because this project has given us a lot of clues as to uh, the sort of research that universities can really claim to perform the best. So the project I'm going to talk about is called Transitioning to Sustainable Sanitation Futures, or um, the funny dunny f for short, and in Australia, dunny means toilet. <laughs> um, so these guys are kind of going, oh, here we go again. But I think it's a good project to actually talk about. So this project was really about closing the loop on the kind of polluting uh, nature of our current sanitation system. And it explored the potential of urine to replace mined phosphate rock as a source of phosphorus, which is obviously essential for global food production. So it involved the installation of urine diverting toilets on campus at UTS, the storage and collection of this urine, and then its transportation out here to Western Sydney University to our Hawkesbury campus, um, where it was used in small scale plant trials. Um, and in addition to this kind of background infrastructure and biophysical experiment, um, it also invo involved everyday toilet users in the process um, who were um, invited via graffiti boards and other forms of uh, social research to comment on, respond to and contribute to the ongoing design of the system. And cohorts from both universities were involved in projects that centred on the experiment. So the design of the experiment was really important because it offers a material form for that integration which is so difficult in transdisciplinary research. So it's a good model also because sustainable sanitation talks about not where the culture currently is at but maybe where it's just pitched a bit ahead of where we are now and again something that universities really should be exploring. Great. Thanks so much, uh, Abby, for that introduction. And we'll follow up with some of those um, points um, a little bit later. So now I'd like to ask Mariella Hatfield, a lecturer in media production, media arts production, to give a short introduction to her work. Thank you very much, Hart, and thanks everyone for being part of this. It was really great hearing from Abby, actually, about the, um, the whole process of undertaking the Living Lab experience and that's certainly something that we're doing at the moment with with a project that's started as a, a collaborative project and we're kind of taking in various directions so we felt that one key focus of the living lab initiative could be to consider the role of storytelling in communicating ideating and inspiring sustainability including documentation of some of these cross-disciplinary processes underway on campus and amongst staff, students and external stakeholders. We've also learnt from our initial scoping out of these projects that many of the initiatives that are happening on campus are, are not actually all that well known. And so what we wanted to do was to start the process of documenting some of these initiatives. So this started last year. So I started doing some documentary interviews with some of the people involved in some of these sustainability initiatives on campus. 
And uh, so we started looking at some of these initiatives, things like, you know, we've got some Green Star buildings and we've got some energy initiatives that are really effective. But one of the little projects off to the side, which we didn't, I think, at the time realise was going to unfold um, in a, such an interesting way, was the fact that there's a little piece of bushland on our campus where our campus is actually on the Parramatta River. It's quite a lovely location. But this little tiny patch of bushland, which you can now see, it's part of South Vineyard Creek, which is a, a little tributary uh, going into the Parramatta River. So what started to happen is that although we started doing interviews with people about this location, we've also started taking students down into the area and to start to get them involved in the process of interviewing experts about the area. So you can see there on the left hand, a guy called Roger Atwater, Dr. O Roger Atwater. He's actually our campus sustainability expert and manager, and he looks after all the campuses and uh, all the sustainability initiatives on the campus. So he's down there with us, being interviewed by myself and the students, and explaining about the ecosystems of the river, the riparian zone, the different plant and animal communities in the area. And the thing about this little patch of land that's, that's really important is that it was kind of discovered by accident. And so here we are in the middle of a very busy urban environment. There's lots of pressures from development on all sides. And in fact, there's going to be a light rail um, occurring. There's, a, there's actually a railway embankment up to the side of this little patch of uh, bushland. So what people wanted to do was to investigate, well, what's going to happen to this little patch of, of bush? And the idea at the moment is that there are various studies um, scoping the area out to try and conserve the area as much as possible because these patches of bushland are actually quite rare in the city. So there are all these different levels of research happening around it, whether it's looking at things like, you know, to do with the issue of climate change, the issue of cooling the commons, which is also something that Abby talks about in her research. And so what we're looking at is, is ways in which different disciplines can look at this area and learn something from it. So even our students, for example, who many of them aren't that knowledgeable at all about ecosystems or about even the value of natural systems, they are starting to become aware of uh, these issues themselves simply by going down there and being involved in the process of interviewing people ab about them. And what we're also discovering is that there are some really interesting features to this area. For example, the Parramatta River, the r original indigenous name was Barramatagal, meeting place of the eels. And so what's been discovered is that in this creek area, there are eels living. So there are eels living there. There are also turtles and tortoises. But the eels are particularly interesting because their life cycle is fascinating. And Barramatagal means the meeting place of the eels. And so all of these resonances, I guess, to, you know, to do with the physical environment itself, also indigenous knowledge. Um, and also, our students are doing uh, another project which involves going to Vanuatu in the South Pacific later in the year. And as it turns out, we found it just sh by sheer happenstance, you know, in talking to some of our experts, that actually the eels, um, it is believed, their life cycle takes them to the South Pacific um, on their breeding cycle. And suddenly everyone went, oh, well, that's, that's fascinating. That's a new angle that we can explore in relation to this Vanuatu project. So, again, the process of investigation reveals things like the global connectedness of ecosystems and it allows then these students to then say oh that's a new angle that's a new part of the story that we can explore and tell and so by having these examples of the living lab it allows exploration investigation documentation storytelling and coming from many angles so if, say for example engineering students can go down into that area and consider it as a case study when they're looking at the development processes you know things like well where do we put light rails well actually wouldn't it be good if we can actually respect and conserve these ecosystems and, and allow things to go around them rather than thinking we need to cut through and destroy. And these are some of the issues I think we're being faced with in urban environments. How can we live in much uh, more harmo harmonious proximity to natural environments? I think it's a, an issue all around the world, not just with us. And so I think looking at these as little case studies to say how can we learn and understand and proceed in a much more harmonious way um, and allow there to be a much greater sense of balance and uh, you know appreciation between various uh, sectors. Mm. Mariella, thank you. Thank you so much. I'm also um, with your particular presentation reminded that we are meeting on Darug land uh, and that we should, uh, as the campus is on Darug land, um, that we pay our respects to the elders, the Darug elders, past and present, Darumatagul being, I think it's the, one of the clans of, of the Derek people um, here in Parramatta. So thank you for the, that and thank you for the 
the reminder of the connection always to the First Peoples of Australia. Alison Gill is lecturer in design uh, and also has worked extensively in areas related to environmental sustainability. Wonderful to have this opportunity to um, talk about some of the projects that we've been working on in cam on campus and uh, to um, have been thrilled to discover Vineyard Creek so close to us and um, be involved. I love the way in which um, Mary Hill has been taking groups of students down to that site in order to establish this sort of rich ecosystem and contacts with other parts of the Pacific where yeah, the eels travel to. So it's been an exciting discovery. In my research over a period of time with um, my colleague, Abby Malik lopez we've been looking at um, cultures of repair. By repair, I mean this opportunity to uh, identify um, moments where items that might be at the end of their life and therefore um, on their way to potentially um, landfill or waste streams could be uh, repurposed, repaired, modified in some way. And um, this is a long-standing interest, but um, the, the project that I wanted to talk about today is a look at the Parramatta area specifically and um, businesses and um, cultures of repair in our community here, very close to the university. So we're interested in um, investigating um, businesses, services and um, also community workshops and groups that would be that um, have identified repair as a possibility and we call this uh, the Repair Cultures Project. Um, I'm hoping that well, we see opportunities here uh, in, after investigating, uh, doing a baseline uh, investigation of what's happening in this community uh, to identify um, or grow cultures and economies and infrastructures of repair as a contribution to a more sustainable material culture and economy. Um, the project was really encouraged by the zero waste aspirations of Western Sydney um, government organisations that we made contact with where repair seems to be a missing part of uh, the picture or the programs that they've identified for dealing with waste, um, where reuse is identified, the reuse of material goods, but not, not necessarily repair being part of that picture. And one of the things that we've noticed over a period of time is that repair is often identified with kind of DIY, DIY and craft um, practices, um, but not necessarily identified as uh, a potential way of dealing with um, waste management and waste avoidance. So um, it's uh, become particularly critical uh, to work or investigate this space now that China has decided to ban 24 categories of, you know, waste, foreign waste to better protect, I guess, their environment and public health triggers. So there's a need for us in Sydney and New South Wales and other parts of Australia to reconsider, you know, the category of waste uh, to address, uh, you know, this what's turning into very quickly a crisis for councils in terms of managing waste recycling. There's the opportunity to look at where we see um, repair as part of the picture of how to rise to the challenge of a zero waste economy. What's interesting for us about the repair picture is that um, its repair offers an op a possibility of um, sustaining and improving the functional life of material goods and services and also um, there's an opportunity to develop skills and empower product users through thinking about um, repair as a viable option for the goods that they use. It also um, offers a very strong kind of counterforce to the momentum of fast fashion that's affecting a lot of different um, product and service streams and hopefully there's opportunities to identify new kinds of economic opportunities and potentially business models for how one might incorporate repair, repair services um, into, yeah, I guess, um, economies of product, of um, retail and, and service. Well, what we want to do is make for, uh, further possibilities to research this space where repair can have an important role in... Um, the picture 
the, the fast developing picture uh, and the urgency around the need to think about re reusing products that we already have. Our research to date has been about ex exploring kind of the functional and symbolic life of goods and services to understand how we might extend the life of goods and um, I think what, what we're noticing is that, as I said, there's an urgency to deal with this um, in terms of the pressures now put on councils to deal with waste streams and then um, also businesses identifying and community groups identifying uh, reuse workshops. We hope that uh, transition design will you know, play a role in identifying these opportunities um, uh, in responding to the waste crisis kind of picture in the local area. So. Thank you, Alison, for that. So I thought we'd um, follow up with, with um, a few Q&A sessions with regards to the presentations that were made. So I thought I'd start just by asking you, Alison, only because it came up recently with me that we've had this problem with kettles kind of failing uh, on us. And, um, and, you know, the last thing I want to do is throw out the kettle. Um, and yet um, I'm not entirely sure whether what you're referring to mm. is there now an, an infrastructure in place is there a place where I could contact someone um, not the official kettle repairers because mm. they seem not to want to repair this kettle but is there a place I could take this to and is there a kind of communication network that mm. I could tap into well I think um Probably I didn't outline adequately that there is a, you know, there's a phenomenon called the repair cafe that is sort of developing in different, that is underway in um, many countries in the world and, and in Australia too. And um, they are often uh, community initiatives set up by organisations sometimes associated with councils and things to uh, respond to those, exactly those kinds of repair needs. Um, the Bower is one organisation that has set up in the Parramatta area, close to the university, um, that doesn't want to necessarily be identified as a repair service. They don't want us necessarily handing over goods to them to um, be responsible for, for repairing, but to hopefully be involved in establishing workshops and um, hopefully tools to assist us and some expertise to for the user to come in and, and do those kinds of repairs. So that's um, one op you know one potential opportunity that I can think of where your your I particular might. kettle <laughs> might get yeah might be okay. might re be repaired. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that would be great. If that mm. can happen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know what I didn't ask you what brand it was. Heart. So no, I'm not I'm, sure. I, yeah, I can't. Yeah. Not being the ABC, uh, yeah, I could yeah. maybe tell you the brand, but um, <laughs> uh, yeah, in the end, actually, um, I, we, we uh, have just sort of given up on mm. trying to think about repairing these. Mm. Two, two of them sort of kind of um, became dysfunctional fairly quickly, mm. so but that's why I was yeah. thinking, rather than, and I think the advice was throw them out, but yeah. again, the, yeah. it would be so much better to, to subject them to some sort of repair yeah. if that were possible. The yeah. kettle is symptomatic of a lot of products where their mechanisms yeah. are built in and it's hard to access and so on. Yeah. Um, so yeah, some people I guess are returning to the stovetop kettle as yeah. a yeah one one solution to that. But you know, sending it to appliance uh, repair manufacturers. I think this is where some of my interest sort of began. Is that they. Uh, obviously reduced in number those mm. kinds of repair appliance repair services and uh, became more difficult to yeah. you know to find those kind of independent mm. operators to, yeah. uh, that, um, not, not that I, I think of it actually it raised another issue which is more uh, in line with your framing of the repair culture with respect to waste and control of waste and I recall now that we we took a number of things down to our tip um, with the idea that there was a recycling area of the tip that you could bring things to. And there were some things they accepted, but the kettles were too small for their recycling uh, interests. And that's, you know, then they said, probably landfill, mm. you know. And we thought, no, you know, we'll take it back and see if we could do something else. Mm. Um, so there was this um, kind of interesting engagement with the... Um, the uh, initiatives around recycling, but uh, in the end, that particular product wasn't able um, to be recycled. So I, I just remembered that was a caveat around around doing that. I thought I'd ask Abby, 
if you would mind uh, going back a step and maybe talking a bit about the provenance of the Living Lab project. Where did that idea come from? It's such a great name. Mm -hmm. uh, I love the name and it sort of uh, suggests all kinds of really interesting possibilities and the South Creek, South Vineyard Creek uh, is a good example of that. But could you talk a bit about the origins of that idea? Yeah, sure. Well, they certainly don't or, um, originate with our project. Living yeah. Labs have got a very long history. There's uh, numerous cases of living labs all over the world where you've essentially got um, a kind of natural and unpredictable social dimension to an experiment so that there is a sense for what really goes on when people encounter or engage with a particular um, experience or geography. But that, um, that concept is particularly suited um, for sustainability. So it's not yeah. always, I mean, there are living labs in... Yeah, all over the world. There's several examples of them where um, they're trialling new technologies or new products um, to see how people live with things and how successful they are and get people's input. But I think for our purposes in terms of sustainability, um, what's so useful about the Living Lab for us is that it helps us to really make small shifts um, with regards to the sustainability of everyday life on our campuses, as well as, as Mariella pointed out, influencing the values of um, the students coming through our programs, because sustainability is not yet um, at the centre of every um, program. It takes a long time um, for these kinds of um, program dimensions and learning outcomes to shift, but uh, the sustainability living labs enable the practical work and the students' praxis to be informed by these questions. And when you think about Vineyard Creek, you're thinking about, as Mariella pointed out, making people aware for something, for, for, about something for the first time in some cases. Whereas decisions which are destructive and unsustainable often come out of not even being aware of the impact or the harm chains that are influenced in that practice. So. This is, I think, where the Living Lab is important, but it certainly has a very long history to the point where some people go, oh, Living Labs, hasn't that been done? Mm -hmm. right. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, does that Yeah, it does. Help? Um, um, yeah, I think I was thinking of another application in, in the phrase living archives and the, a way of kind of taking the archiving process and um, having them kind of more contemporary, uh, you know, putting them in a contemporary context yeah. and making them work. But um, that was the sense I had of something active and, yeah, I mean, and happening. I think that that, well, that's right. And mm. I think that, you know, one of the key objectives is collaborative learning, as I tried to point out, but also that open-endedness where you're, you're kind of, it's generative in that you're not quite sure where it's going to head or what form mm. it's going to take. And yeah. that's obviously a risk that... Um, you know, the university can accommodate much more easily than stakeholders outside, possibly. So, um, yes, I mean, you're right, that kind of um, open-ended approach is very well suited to yeah. a living lab enterprise, mm. yeah. I thought I'd, I'd ask Mariella if you could also expand a little bit. Um, one of the research themes that we know is active in the university is something referred to as resilient cities mm. and, and the urban environment. And it seems to me that this is a, a great example of... Um, something that would be part of that research theme and that somehow articulates with the idea of the resilient city. Mm -hmm. Do you see it the same way? And could you talk a bit about Sydney and the city of Sydney and Parramatta and where this sort of fits into the particularity of the way in which this city has been, in a sense, on a possible road to ruin with regards to its de development policies? Yeah, thanks, Hart. Um, yeah, so I guess this question of resilient cities and, you know, how do we respond to some of these really big challenges? And um, it's a bit like looking at all the big issues such as whether it's climate change, whether it is um, urban development. They often seem really enormous sort of problems. And uh, how do we respond when sometimes we, we feel that, you know, the problems or the, the problems that arise out of all of these things, sort of, you know, could seem to be quite sometimes insurmountable or, you know, wicked problems. And so um, so I come back actually to a phrase that, um, that Abby uh, mentioned some time ago. And, um, there was a, a future scenario scholar, Tony Fry, who talked about the idea of dig where you stand. And, and the pr that principle is to try and look in your local situation um, and to try and see how you can bring uh, the learnings from that, like, micro... Um, 
situation or um, case study or whatever it might be and how can you then tr see if you can learn something to apply on, on a larger scale. So even with something like the South Vineyard Creek story, I think there are so many lessons that can be explored and learnt there, um, whether it's, it's looking at things like, um, you know, what is there in this ecosystem um, to who are some of the stakeholders involved. Like we already know that there are a whole lot of community members who are involved. So there are local council people who are very much involved. There are um, Indigenous people. There's a whole Clean Up Australia group. There are all these there's people, you know, called the river keepers who are very much involved. So you've got this sort of community that, that grows out and then we've got the university as well and the learning that, that's taking place. And actually this project came about because originally we were talking about this concept called the Sustainathon where we were actually actually doing or looking at inviting people onto the campus and, and looking at a kind of an, an ideation process around, okay, well, what kind of cities do we want to create or what kind of low locational, you know, um, you know, sort of I ideal scenarios would we like mm -hmm. to be able to create? And in a way we thought, well, let's bring it back to our immediate situation, try and tell some of our stories locally and then um, allow it to open up to some of those other. So I think this idea of being able to... Um, document or capture some of our stories here and then be able to invite people onto the campus and then explore and discuss some of the possibilities for Sydney um, or for, for Parramatta and actually broaden this conversation. I think ultimately we would hope that we could do that at some stage. I, I hope that we're possibly going to do that. I think there is a possibility yeah. for, for that to have these conversations and say, okay, well, sometimes these problems seem so big, but what can we do in our immediate situation? And then see how can that uh, ripple out into a wider field perhaps and mm -hmm. and to help people also feel that they're not just uh, you know subject to forces beyond their control that actually people can get involved in things and uh, and that there can be engagement and people can be part of the decision making processes mm -hmm. um, because I think there's you know there's a lot of discussion at the moment about um, you know our political culture you know the idea that democracy is possibly in trouble because people do feel left out of decision-making processes. And I think if we can show that there are ways in which people can engage and do so meaningfully and to communicate and, and feel that they're being heard and actually see that they're being heard, I think the more we can establish these possibilities, then, yeah. you know, that can feed into the culture. Yeah, I don't know what other people think about that. Can I jump in? I, yeah. I know I've been in the river bed with um, Mariella when she's been talking with, or we've been having a range of conversations with the river keepers, with Roger as the campus uh, sustainability um, manager. And um, just going back to that point about resilience, one of the stories that really remained with me was the river keeper pointing to particular tree species in the, surrounding the riverbed that have been there for, you know, hundreds of years and, you know, an image of resilience and them, uh, you know, being sort of exposed to us, uh, you know, this creek being made visible and the ecosystem that, you know, is very much part of it right next to our campus, mm. you know, in a way that, uh, you know, I certainly wasn't aware of until, yeah, this was brought to my attention. Yeah, so the the, the trees resilience, you know, the, the eels resilience in the face of, yeah, incredible kind of urban development around it in terms of the light rail mm. yeah, and the industrial sites um, encroaching on them to, to the right of the riverbed and then the campus life right next to it. Uh, yeah. yeah, so to me that was a very powerful image of kind of yeah, species resilience. Yeah. And, mm. and actually on that topic of species mm. resilience, mm. I mean mm. they are they're, they're trees like swamp mahoganies mm. and they, they think that in the swamp mahoganies there may be powerful owls mm. who can also come. Now and again who would have thought in this mm. you know urban environment Environment, you know that we that they are there. That there are tortoises, there are turtles, there are eels, mm. there are you know there are the the mangrove areas all the way up to the eucalyptus communities, and then all these river dragons. So there are a lot of creatures mm. living there that we don't even know about. So you're right; they mm. are they are such a powerful symbol of resilience, and we have so much to learn from these environments the uh, and the conversations. This, yeah. yeah, yeah. Consider mm. that, mm. and particularly against the mm. the problems now afflicting the high country, say, in Australia, you know, uh, it wasn't the case that there was much in the way of fire in the high country. Now we know the fires mm -hmm. that have ranged in the high country has not only removed habitat, but now threatened many species in that part of the country. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so you can tie climate change directly to 
the ending of species uh, mm -hmm. of particular animals in this country. And now, um, so we have, you know, those narratives as well that we have to kind of entertain as part of the process of thinking more deeply mm -hmm. about uh, the impact and the effect of climate change. And if this mm -hmm. is an example of, as you say, resistance or um, in, in a way resilience, then um, that goes to the heart of, I think, some of the most important aspects of what we're facing in uh, the context of this, um, this kind of crisis. Um, the other, of course, the, the kind of um, things that we're hearing about, and it's particularly in our area of the, the globe, the way in which the, um, the impact of climate change on a Antarctica, particularly West Antarctica, um, unlike the, um, the ice flows in the Arctic, that uh, that can float, um, the uh, the ice pack on on ground on Antarctic ground um, actually melts into the sea, mm -hmm. and that effect of sea rise, uh, at least based on a very recent report, um, seems to suggest um, that in uh, potential kind of concern around. Um, sea levels rising would be something in our area, in our region here, in the southern hemisphere that we'd have to sort of think carefully about. In that regard, um, it seems like um, you can't really ignore or, in a sense, isolate oneself from um, any of the kind of potential concerns that arise when we think of the challenges of something like climate change. Wondering if we continue the conversation a bit. Um, I can certainly ask questions, but feel free to to jump in any time. I know that, Alison, you've been involved for some time in thinking about fashion. So I'm wondering if there was elements of your engagement with fashion that also touched on sustainability concerns. Yeah, yeah I mean, I think that uh, that's probably the, um, the uh, precedent picture to the repair project in that it was out of um, examples of, you know, of st the, I guess the observation of the Ex, you know, acceleration of the fashion industry, um, now known as, you know, widely termed as fast fashion, uh, that um, issues around um, slowing down that speed of consumption and identifying opportunities to uh, repurpose, reuse clothing became something of, of real interest to myself and, and Abby. And so, um, that's, I think that's the, uh, the background story to you know, how we became really interested in, in repair. Right. Um, certainly, you know, I've got long, long standing interests in second hand clothing and uh, I guess promoting or recognising that one of the uh, reasons why people dislike buying second hand clothing rather than new clothing is about you know perceptions of value and we think there's really interesting challenges for visual designers and media makers to really um, look at how you change you know make second hand more appealing and you know challenge that idea that to be uh, attractive and appealing it has to be new rather than well loved or yeah experienced yeah. and so on so yeah I'm um, seeing that as a really one of the kind of things that needs to be challenged front on and, right. yeah, yeah that uh, kind of yeah. um, the perceptions of yeah. consumer consumer value are really um, yeah. fundamental to these issues so um, yeah. You know, the fashion industry is pretty good at churning out, you know, at remarkable speed, the new and the fabulous. There's a lot going on in the industry already now to um, challenge that. The issue is one of scale, you know, is a huge problem of scale um, and really kind of amplifying the initiatives that are underway to yeah, nuance that picture sure. of the fast fashion industry. Yeah, yeah. daughter's favourite spots mm. in Sydney is reverse garbage. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> so, yeah, uh, looking for all those um, second-hand yeah. items. And one of the pictures, sorry, to add to the picture of what I didn't detail is what we actually found in Parramatta and there's a fantastic um, business of of sari repurposing and um, repair that's happening in the Indian community yeah. in, in Parramatta. Um, yeah and uh, a real t tradition of passing on saris and textiles 
intergenerationally and and um, passing on skills of repair and so on. So there are these real niche pockets of uh, yeah, niche activity which are really fascinating um, and models of yeah potentially models of um, yeah business models for yeah setting up alternative ways of. Um, yeah, retailing and uh, exchanging clothing. So mm. I didn't want to mm. let this mm. session end, Mary Ellen, mm. without referring to your film, The Future Makers. Uh, so Mary Ellen is a, a, a filmmaker uh, and made a, an amazingly, uh, I guess you'd say, sort of prescient, anticipatory film back how long ago now? It's a while ago. It's a while ago. Yeah, it's a while ago. But it's still <laughs> very, very relevant. And it's amazingly, I mean, it was amazingly prescient to make a film like that. Um, so I'm wondering if you could just do a quick summary of the film mm -hmm. and, sure. and what you feel now is your next kind of step as far as that right. particular, I guess, uh, the film's main message, whether mm -hmm. that still is relevant to mm -hmm. you or how you would advance it. Okay, yeah, thanks very much. Yeah, um, so the film The Future Makers uh, yeah, came out you know, a few years ago now and uh, the original idea came about because uh, there was a lot of discussion happening about climate change at that time. This was probably um, yeah, late, late uh, like 2005, 6, 7, that, that sort of period. And it seemed to me that there was a lot of focus on you know, I, I mean, we know it's a problem. It's 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 a very big problem. But um, I, I just felt that there was so much of a focus on the problem that uh, I felt that I wasn't seeing as many stories about the solutions. And uh, I guess because I had been following different people who were talking about solutions or exploring possible solutions, um, I thought, oh, I'm getting really annoyed at <laughs> this problem. And you know, why don't we actually explore some of the potential solutions? <laughs> and um, I just wanted to hear more stories about possibility rather than stories about, you know, how dreadful, and, you know, and I mean, the thing is that, look, we, it's hard to get away from it, the, the apocalyptic nature of the problem, you know, that it, it, it is potentially really, you know, uh, serious, it's massively serious, and for many people, um, you know, who feel that the problem, it, look, it's, it's all over, it's, it's happening now, and there's actually nothing we can do on a large scale, um, and, and it's just now adaptation, that's all that we can do, uh, and I, I just thought, well, you know, Let's let's look at what is within our grasp. You know, what can we do to deal with these problems? And it's not just to do with one aspect only. It's actually looking at what are the options in terms of a range of industries. So, but what I wanted to do, I guess, was to look at um, examples or stories of people who were exploring sort of possible options. And so, as it turned out with the film, uh, I, I ended up. Uh, exploring a range of stories around renewable energy in Australia and I mean the initial idea was to actually look at a range of industries so it was to look at you know it didn't matter whether it was agriculture or you know industrial practice you know manufacturing mm -hmm. or the way we run our economy is that to, to look at what are some of the ideas and what are some of the people exploring alternate options you know as it turned out with with um, the film itself it was Discovery Channel who was really interested in the concept and they said okay go ahead and make the film but we you know let's kind of bring the focus back to just looking at renewable energy so we looked at renewable energy in Australia um, a series of case studies and examples of people working in the space so we looked at solar energy examples at that time um, th there are some people working in uh, solar photovoltaics at University of New South Wales so we interviewed them um, about you know the use of uh, solar PV we looked at solar thermal at that time um, Dr David Mills was the one of the pioneers of solar thermal and his work was really starting to be recognized overseas so that was a really important case study uh, we looked at geothermal energy in Australia which has had a difficult um, history as, a, as a, and, and trajectory um, but one of the principles I was really interested in was the concept of biomimicry, so looking to nature for solutions. And uh, so I did an interview with Janine Benyus, um, who is the author of Biomimicry, or Innovation Inspired by Nature. And so we looked at a bunch of tidal power and wave power examples and, and other forms of renewable energy in practice, but bringing in you know, to the picture, the idea of um, nature as as an informing principle, and so biomimicry is part of that. But I'm also really interested in the concept of biophilia, so the human affinity with nature, 
and it can be something that we forget about or that we, we're not really made aware of or that we sort of deny. And actually, and even working with my students at the moment, you know, and talking to them and saying, okay, so what's your relationship with the natural world? And, and they're, they're sort of like, what? <laughs> what are you asking us this for? And I'm like, mm. oh, well, let's think about it. Mm. And... Um, and it's a big area of research, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. 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 And so, you know, exploring things like nature deficit disorder. And, uh, mm. and so students, you know, we've been looking at different ways in which they can relate to the natural world. And, in f and that we, you know, we came across the concept of forest bathing, which is a Japanese um, cultural thing, it's about going into the natural environment. And um, so, so mm. it, it's good to bring some of these concepts, um, you know. So with the Future Makers, yes, the film... Um, had its run, it's, it's been on television, you know, Discovery Channel ran it. It's also been in lots of film festivals and uh, we've also shown it in a lot of community and corporate and organisational uh, contexts. Mm. Um, I mean, for me personally from that, it would be great to do Future Makers, you know, yeah, the follow-up. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, because a lot has happened since then. Mm. Um, with Australia, <laughs> there's been many ups and downs with the renewable mm. energy landscape. Mm. Uh, it'd be wonderful to... It, in actual fact, renewable energy in Australia has really, um, it's ramped up massively since that time. Mm. But um, in terms of the public focus, there are a lot of people who would be surprised to hear that mm. because of, um, mm. you know, the... Uh, kind of political landscape, I yeah, guess, hasn't been politics, very friendly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. in actual fact, the uptake, people's use of renewables has been really enormous. Yeah. And also yeah. the improvement in battery technology yeah. has meant an enormous uh, possibility with storing you know, uh, that solar energy, which wasn't really possible when yeah. you made your film. You know, yeah. We now have really interesting options there, not only prototypes, but beyond prototypes of yeah. very effective battery technologies for storing. Yes, so absolutely. I think, yeah, future makers yeah. too, why not, you know? <laughs> yeah. uh, absolutely. Okay. Yes, mm. yeah, uh, it's been a great project, so yeah, thank so you. I think it's mm. a really important reminder of the role of film and media, you know, again, in supporting and amplifying these these stories of yeah, innovation and yeah, um, mm. important um, I guess progress or yeah development with e all of these initiatives, but or yeah also in, in any of it the stories of sustainability on campus was what mm -hmm. we were also really motivated to cover, uh, like the Vineyard mm -hmm. Creek one, but mm -hmm. any other examples that yeah. are where we can use them as um, scenarios for our students to learn about yeah, mm -hmm. their own value system and yeah, mm -hmm. their own practices uh, while using media. To yeah. Yeah. important educational mm. yeah. priorities there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think we're, we're close to our, our uh, time limit uh, in the studio, so let me thank Abby, who's not here, but <laughs> Alison for your contribution and Mariella for your contribution today. And thank you to the University of Alberta and the Round the World Conference and for making sustainability your theme because it's something that's obviously dear to, to us here in Western Sydney. Um, and so um, good luck to you for the rest of the day, the conference. Thanks so much. Thank you all. Thanks very much. Well, so I would like to thank uh, Western Sydney University. Uh, Western Sydney University has actually been a partner uh, with us for the many years we've been doing around the world. And, uh, and uh, it's just, it's great to work with you again. I think over the years, there's been over 40 researchers coming from uh, Australia. Um, and these are researchers that it would be very difficult to, to bring here given how far away it is. Uh, it would be difficult to bring us together in, in other ways. So I'd like to thank the panel at Western Sydney uh, and talk a moment now about tomorrow. Tomorrow is the fifth and last day of this iteration, this sixth uh, Around the World Conference. And tomorrow the topic is Conscious Computing from Energy Consumption to the Ethics of Data Visualization. And we're going to have a panel starting at 11 a.m. Mountain Time on IT energy consumption. So it's time to look at uh, the consumption of events like this and, and other uh, uses of information technology. Then we're going to have at 12, we're going to have a round table on minimal computing. This is going to be a very interesting one with Rupika Rissam, Alex Gill, and John Simpson. And at 12.30, there's going to be a workshop. Unfortunately, the workshop has limited seats, and I believe they're all taken. So uh, you, you, you can find out what you're missing. Uh, but the workshop will be led by uh, Joshua Korenblatt, 
and it's going to be about how to apply data visualization to promote thinking, caring, and leading a nonprofit case study. And uh, so I would like again to thank all the chairs and participants today and uh, invite you to come and join us tomorrow. And if you missed something or wanted to hear it again, uh, if you go to our YouTube channel, you can find that we are almost immediately uh, archiving things where, uh, so that you can, you can watch things over again. Thank you very much. Have a great evening and see you tomorrow.